it's so sad to me when people are like, well, you're bilingual. I'm like, oh, that only in the U.S. does that carry right, anyway. Yeah. Like, <laughs> anywhere yeah. else, it's like you're only bilingual. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was lucky enough to be able to sit down with Miss Highland and Mr. Lopez, who teach Spanish and French at Incline High. We were able to have important discussions about all things language learning, like their opinions on the U.S.'s world language system and any advice that they would give to language learners. I hope you enjoy their conversations. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Je m'appelle Nestor Lopez. Um, je suis prof uh, depuis cinq, trois mois. Je suis prof depuis trois mois, donc c'est mon première année d'être prof. Et uh, la partie préférée d'être prof, c'est d'enseigner le langage français, d'enseigner la langue française. Ça, c'est mon uh, partie préférée. Hola, me llamo Señorita Highland y soy una maestra de español. He sido una maestra por tres años, pues estoy en mi tercer año eh, ahorita. Y mi, lugar, mi parte favorita de enseñar um, un lenguaje eh, realmente es, es los, son los chicos. Eh, los chicos son eh, muy divertidos y, y me encantan. Hi, my name is Miss Highland and I'm a teacher of Spanish. I've been a teacher of Spanish for three years. Well, this is my third year. Um, my favorite part of teaching is the kids because they're fun and I love them. I said hello, my name is Mr. Lopez. Um, I have been a teacher for five, I said five, five, three months. So this is my first year teaching. And I said my favorite part of being a teacher, of teaching, is being able to teach the French language. That's my favorite part. So first, I wanted to ask you, what encouraged you to pursue learning a language in the first place? That's such a good question, because it's not a thing that you usually dream of as a kid, like I want to mm. be a language teacher. <laughs> it's sort of right. random. Um, so I always knew I wanted to be a teacher starting in about middle school. I knew I loved kids and I was like, mm. how can I work with kids? And my dad is a teacher and my mom's a children's librarian. And um, I knew that she was very lucky at a library that was wonderful. Like mm. I probably wouldn't find in a library like that again. So I decided, well, I have a lot more choice with being a teacher, so I'll teach because I have a lot more agency over my future that way. Um, and also I knew there was a lot, a lot of avenues you could go in education. So mm-hmm. I picked education first, and then I was thinking about, well, what, what do I do I want to teach and what age mm-hmm. level? And as I got to high school, it was the first time I started taking Spanish because at my middle school, the way that it was structured, we had to do... Um, it took three periods to do our core classes of, of English and math, like mm-hmm. so that would trade back and forth the extra flex period. Mm-hmm. And because of that, we only got one elective in middle school, which was really sad because I would have taken Spanish in middle mm-hmm. school and figured it out a lot faster. Um, but anyhow, the, you know, catching up state standards, all those things. So we got to, so when I got to high school, I started taking Spanish for the first time and um, I noticed that it just made sense to me. Mm -hmm. Like it just clicked and it was almost like a math problem. You know, when a math problem just, you get to the end, it's like, ah, like it just clicks. (laughs) It just felt that way with language, but even more than math, I've always loved math, but even more than math, language also had this whole artistic cultural side that just Mm -hmm. complexified everything. Right. Um, So it just drew me in because it was so complex. And, And also, honestly, I loved my Spanish teacher. He was... He was fantastic, and I just thought, you know, if if these are the kind of people who teach a world language, I want to be with those people, mm-hmm. and I can see myself getting along with them and being like them, and 
it just feels like my world. So yeah. I was, I just sort of went in that direction. I started learning French when I was in high school. So I went to Worcester High School in Reno and I never, I never really thought about learning French. Mm -hmm. I thought I need to take a world language and it needs to be for four years. And I figured I already know Spanish, mm -hmm. so I'm going to take French. Mm -hmm. That was my thought. And my thought was never, I want to learn French. It was, it was mostly like, okay, what are the options I have that are outside of Spanish? Mm -hmm. And French is one of them. Um, my, I had two French teachers. They were both amazing. Um, one of them was from France, is from France. Mm -hmm. And the way she talked about where she was from, what she did in France, mm -hmm. how she grew up, her travels, how she ended up in the United States. It all was very inspirational. And I wanted to go to France one day. That mm -hmm. was my thought. I want to I wanna practice what I'm learning, uh, which was French. And I want to continue in, and I want to go to France. And I just want to explore how she explored. Mm -hmm. So. I think languages and how I learned it um, it's more than just being able to say something. It's also a lot of culture. Mm -hmm. And when I would learn French, like I said, it was more than just the language. My French teacher, she would say, oh, yeah, I used to mm -hmm. do this. This is what we would do. I know in the United States you do this. We do this differently. Mm -hmm. And it kind of sparked an interest. Okay, so I know this language. Now I want to go experience all those things mm -hmm. because I can speak French where I, would, I could practice French, you know, um, on the computer, or I can pick up a book and learn it. Mm -hmm. But it's not the same thing as going to France or going to a French-speaking country mm -hmm. and ex having the experience with native French speakers right. and, and uh, interacting with the culture. My junior year, I studied abroad in Spain for the first mm -hmm. time. And when I studied abroad, it was like it all just connected. Like right. I, I just could see how how language really was a tool in order to accomplish like deeper things, mm -hmm. like growing relationships cross-culturally and, and how to understand another perspective and then challenge your own perspective. Because mm -hmm. like every, I feel like when we grow up, we... We just go through life going like, yeah, this is how life works. This is normal. Mm -hmm. And then you get to college and you're like, oh my gosh, I was, my, my lens was so small. Right. Like I, I could have, like, I didn't even consider that maybe this was more important than that or, mm -hmm. yeah. So it wasn't until, until studying abroad and like living with a host family and traveling and navigating another culture and trying to build friendships in another culture and study in another culture and interact with professors in another culture. Mm -hmm. Like all those things demanded that I understand the culture like the language and the language mattered because it was the avenue for communication. Mm -hmm. But what really mattered was did I understand who they were and what was what was important to them. Right. So the culture totally, totally changed how mm -hmm. I use the language. Yeah. So I, I'd say you can't separate them. I lived with the host family mm -hmm. and I got to speak French every day only French because my host family didn't speak English. And speaking French every day with native French speakers, mm -hmm. you pick up on things that you never learned right. in the school system. Yeah. And when I finished my study abroad, my French was at a whole new level. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it was extreme growth that mm -hmm. I experienced paired with classes, mm -hmm. classes and host family. It was just, my French grew a lot. Would you advocate for like a structured language immersion, I guess? So that's the thing, that's, um, that's the, uh, that would be the goal because, so there's two ways of learning a language. Mm -hmm. You can either one, 
learn the structure. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is called learning. So that is meaning, okay, this is how you say I, mm-hmm. um, the verb followed by, it's a very structured approach. Mm-hmm. And you can either do that. The second option is to immerse yourself inside of an atmosphere where the language is present. Mm-hmm. So going to France, living with the host family, and that is called acquiring a language. And both, when you do both, that is the perfect, mm-hmm. perfect goal. You are learning the structure, how to write it, how to, what goes first, what goes second. Here goes the adjective, followed by the verb, mm-hmm. followed by the noun, whatever. And then you practice it on real people and yeah. you see how other people use it. And so when you have both of them as a study abroad program should, um, like you say, structured, learning it and also practicing it and acquiring it from other people, that would be the best scenario. Why do you think so many people are dissuaded from learning a language? Oh my gosh, that's an easy question. It's hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's right. so much work. <laughs> um, it, yeah, and it, I mean, honestly, I wouldn't say I was like fluent mm-hmm. in Spanish mm-hmm. until a, it took me about a decade. Yeah. And, um, and I'm not bad at learning a language. Like I, I, Mm-hmm. Like that was a normal pace. Right. <laughs> um, I, it probably, it probably would have gone faster if I'd like moved to a country and just lived there. I mean, right. not just study abroad, but live there mm-hmm. because then it would have like necessitated that I grow right. quickly. You have to have that need to do it because mm-hmm. if you don't have that need, then it's, it's really hard and it, it's, mm-hmm. you, you don't have a reason like all the people I know abroad who have learned like English because English mm-hmm. sucks to learn right like, yeah <laughs> second language they do it because they will not have a livelihood if they don't speak English right so you have to have that motivation or that drive mm-hmm. and so I think that's why most people get as far as they can and then kind of quit or peter mm-hmm. out or whatever Unfortunately, it's just one of those things here in the United States. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, when you go to Europe um, or when you look at European statistics on uh, second language acquisition, Mm -hmm. Europeans, um, I believe it's around 40 to 50 percent of Europeans speak another language Mm -hmm. compared to about 20, 30 Mm percent of Americans speak another language. And that's a vast difference. Right. And it has to be tied, I believe it has to be tied with what, what we value mm-hmm. and what the world values. And I think, I believe that there isn't a value placed upon second languages mm-hmm. in the United States just because English is so dominant. Um, I can give you a scenario. When I lived in France, I, lived, uh, I had a host brother and the host brother was learning business. Mm-hmm. And he told me, I cannot find a job here in France if I do not learn English. Mm-hmm. And I mean, just by that story, it tells you the value and the importance of English. Right. And we, as Americans, we know English, we grew up with English. And there might be this thought, there might be this um, attitude that English is just the best language. It's a world language. Every country wants to learn English. And when we take that perspective that English is the best, it might diminish uh, learning other languages because it might not be necessary since we already learn English. I was curious what your opinions are on the U.S.'s mm. education mm-hmm. for world languages. Because, yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great question. Um, I, <laughs> it's, it's a, we are, a, a, we are oddly privileged in our isolation. Mm-hmm. Um, the rest of the world, like our country is so massive that mm-hmm. you can, mo- lots of people, it's like, it's like 20%. 
twenty percent of the population has never been internet like across like out of their tri-state area or something wow. like it's or 50 i can't remember it's like mm -hmm. a big chunk so if you because it's big enough like mm -hmm. if you lots of people that's like multiple countries right so yeah if so a lot of people there's no they don't feel that need that motivation to need mm -hmm. to like learn another language because everyone talks english mm -hmm. um and it's, even if they just go dip into the border of mexico like right in the border towns there's a lot of english or mm -hmm. broken english or something mm -hmm. right and obviously canada all speaks english so mm -hmm. um but i would say other cultures because their countries are so much smaller like there's a huge necessity right so what they often do is um, you'll have your home dialect of whatever your language is that you speak with your family mm -hmm. and that that's like regional right yeah and then when you go to school you start learning the like national language mm -hmm. so like if you were romanian for example mm -hmm. um you would learn your own family's like community dialect mm -hmm. then you would go learn romanian at school mm -hmm. and then after like a maybe a year or two in school then mm -hmm. you learn english because everyone needs english mm -hmm. and then so that's already trilingual right <laughs> and then you work on that for like through middle school and then in high school you pick up your fourth language because at that right. point they're like you're so fluent what else would you like mm -hmm. and then they often pick like german because it's now becoming the language of business so we need to start earlier. Yeah. Like, and we also it need to, we need to be able to, to care that people mm -hmm. know other languages. Right. Like, I, I think that this happens more in more coastal areas because mm -hmm. there's more diversity. And so you want to be able to communicate with people who are immigrants that maybe don't even speak English. Um, but I think the more central into the U.S. you get, the less pressure there is to do that. A lot of schools won't start teaching a language until no. maybe middle school. Maybe. But yeah, a lot of people won't be able to have a language class until high school. Yeah, yeah. So. And actually, technically, uh, when you hit puberty, your ability to like right. absorb language just mm -hmm. plummets. Like, yeah. It doesn't mean you can't. It just mm -hmm. means it's a lot harder. You yeah. have to do it cognitively, actively, or like try to. Mm -hmm. Versus when you're younger, you can just absorb it. Right. So. Yeah. I really wish to an elementary school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. I guess if we were to take something from the European education system to improve American world language education, what would you what would you advocate for? Yeah, I can give you an example. So in Europe, there's a program called Erasmus, mm -hmm. Erasmus, and it is a study abroad program for high schoolers, okay? And it is a free study abroad program for high schoolers. Mm -hmm. So what, and that's, this is one of the things of the European Union since they're unified, mm -hmm. is that any student, say a senior, junior, mostly junior seniors, is that they can go to another country and say a French high schooler, junior, they can go to Spain mm -hmm. and finish their senior year in Spain and still graduate with the same diploma, high school diploma. Mm -hmm. um, and this program allows high school students to study abroad for mm -hmm. free. Um, but it's based on this, uh, it's based on the European Union that open borders, um, common curriculum and I mean, somehow, um, in the United States, if that could be possible, you know, mm -hmm. um, of course it's not, no, it's not, we can't, it can't be compared to the European Union, but that is one of the things that the European, European Union has that the United States doesn't have mm -hmm. is this openness of being able to allow high school students to study abroad for free to learn mm -hmm. a new language. Right. It's like more accessible to mm -hmm. more people. Yes, it's definitely more accessible mm -hmm. for high school students. And, and if they don't want to, then that's okay. Yeah. But most students, when they see that you can study abroad in a different country, mm -hmm. most of them do. I know that the U.S. has some opportunities to study abroad, but I know that they're more limited than the opportunities that there might be for high school students in Europe to study abroad. 
Why would you say that there are so few opportunities, I guess, to study abroad mm -hmm. in high school for the U.S.? Yeah, it, it goes back to uh, what you were saying about accessibility. Mm -hmm. You have to, um, there's certain access, it's not accessible for everybody right. to study abroad. Um, you have to look at financially, you have to look at what type of programs. Mm -hmm. Is it an exchange student or is the student just studying abroad? Mm -hmm. You also have to look at curriculum. Mm -hmm. Um, what the student's going to learn. But I think it's just mostly accessibility. Right. There's this idea that, oh, to study abroad, you have to learn the new language. Mm -hmm. That is false. I had study abroad peers mm -hmm. who knew nothing mm -hmm. of French, and they took classes and they, they transferred to their colleges. But it's this accessibility that if we make it accessible, that anybody can do it, mm -hmm. no matter the financial circumstances, no matter the living circumstances, um, no matter the education or no matter how much you know the language, mm -hmm. anybody can do it. And if we make that a priority of being a, making it accessible, I think you'll see a big growth in how many students would want to study abroad. Yeah. Um, would you say that learning a language is, I don't know, I guess is like harder for people from lower income communities because there is that like that idea that maybe learning a language isn't accessible to them that's a good question <laughs> for these families i think it's definitely harder for them to study abroad mm -hmm. it's definitely harder for them to study abroad because the idea of them paying for regular school yeah is a challenge mm -hmm. and if you magnify that to okay now i have to pay for study abroad mm -hmm. i'll never be able to afford it so being able to study abroad for um, um lower economic status uh families is definitely a bigger challenge for them but in terms of in terms of promoting just regular mm -hmm. um, languages in high school i think it's more of um advertising it as valuable. Mm -hmm. And I guess, what w advice would you give to somebody who's, you know, in high school or who's an adult who's trying to learn another language. The pro of learning a language when you're when you're older is that you have a greater understanding of how language works. Mm -hmm. And so I would say like I mean even Kanina was an amazing English mm -hmm. teacher and I'm all, I'm always thankful to him because he teaches mm -hmm. everybody all the roots and suffixes mm -hmm. and pre and then they just bring that to Spanish and that helps right. already or when they are they have some activity they do. I don't know, one of my kids mm -hmm. did it in one of my classes diagramming a sentence but in some kind of special way like i don't mm -hmm. know what they what they're do you know what that's called the canino makes you do um dlg that's it yeah DLG, yeah <laughs> <laughs> so he so like understand the the building blocks you're working mm -hmm. with and then that will make picking up a language much easier i had one last question to end the interview absolutely um, what would you say sums up your philosophy when it comes to teaching a language? Oh, okay, yeah. So there's sort of, um, I mean, the pendulum is always swinging under education, mm -hmm. so it's always changing. But uh, the, the biggest thing that you can do is structured immersion so mm -hmm. like you need immersion of course or mm -hmm. you're not going to have that fluency or that you won't hear what's n what naturally sounds mm -hmm. right or you yeah you won't get that fluency but you also just can't get dumped into a situation where you just don't understand anything that's overwhelming right so um so what you really need is like a a slow release yeah. of immersion so that's what i try i aim for so we play a lot of games in my classes mm -hmm. um because ultimately like you're going to learn what you find interesting so mm -hmm. if i make it boring I, it's not right. going to yeah. stick yeah so we do lots of games lots of stories that kind of thing and because they all have immersion in them mm -hmm. but i can i can shelter like how much vocab i release at yeah. once right
my philosophy. This is a good question because I I had to do this for uh, your research. But um, my philosophy is is again I want to implement the two types of learning, right? So mm -hmm. again, the first option is learning, mm -hmm. where I tell the students, okay, first you do. I, mm -hmm. okay, and then you do run, and then you do the rest, mm -hmm. all in French. So I tell them the structure, okay, this is what you do. You need this, 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 and this. This is how you create a sentence. Mm -hmm. I do that. But I also inc include acquiring a language, mm -hmm. which is different from learning a language, which is I try to give them as much French as possible, mm -hmm. and eventually they'll pick it up. Mm -hmm. They will get as much language, because I try to replicate it. They can't go to, most of them are not gonna study abroad. Mm -hmm. But um, I try to replicate studying abroad as much as I can in French. Mm -hmm. I speak in French all the time. Yeah. And when I teach them as a structure, okay, you need this, 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 A plus B, and then you get sentence. Mm -hmm. I do the structure and then I do the um, acquisition, which is just give them everything in French mm -hmm. and they'll pick it up. Um, so I implement those two strategies for teaching a language. I um, have them learn the language Mm -hmm. structure and then I have them acquire the language which is give them as much French as possible mm -hmm. yeah and one of my objectives is to make French class especially for my younger students is make it fun mm -hmm. because if it's not fun they're gonna be disinterested and they're gonna say it's too hard mm -hmm. in reality it's not hard it just takes time right yeah It definitely takes time. Mm -hmm. um, I would just say stick with it mm -hmm. because y we cannot, I have this, I, told, I tell my freshman one, two students, mm -hmm. you have learned nothing so far. You came into this class knowing nothing of French. Mm -hmm. You can only get better from here. Right. Because you can't get worse when you don't know the mm -hmm. subject. You can only grow higher. Yeah. And that's what I tell my students. And I had a student who said, I played a video for them, mm. all in French, and they said, wait, you understood all of that? And I told them, yeah, I have mm. so many years of experience, and if you stick with it, you will be too. Mm. And it comes with time and patience. Yeah, That would be my advice for somebody learning Spanish or French mm. or anything. It takes time. Thank you again to Ms. Highland and Mr. Lopez for sitting down with me to discuss language education. I hope that this conversation was helpful to anybody who's been considering picking up a new language or may have been struggling with a language that they're already learning. Thank you so much.